I, I don't, yep, I think this thing's working. So I can't stand to stand behind the podium, so you'll have to forgive me. And based on that last um, presenter, I wanted to let you know that we have some innovative contracts that are going to be coming out, set aside for small businesses. <laughs> but actually, we are going to, I'll talk about it in a little bit. Now, one of the things that I've heard, I've been, People have been texting and emailing me about this event a whole time, giving me pointers of things that I need to bring up. One thing I did hear, though, is you guys have been told over and over again today the history of CMMC. So show of hands, how, how many of you truly understand why we are where we are with CMMC? All right, not everybody raised their hand. What the heck? Okay, so here's the deal. You guys are familiar with the, the DFARS clause. Are you ready? 252-204-7012, right? That said that you are supposed to be compliant with the NIST 800-171 requirements. Came out in 2013. You had to start definitively being compliant December 31st of 2017, right? And then we had that nasty IG investigation and the Navy Cyber Readiness Review that said, yeah, not so much, right? They went out and they looked at companies and they said, yeah, they're not doing what they say they're doing. Now, remember that clause required you guys all to be compliant since that time, and all of you have said, yeah, I'm compliant, right? And we told you during that clause that you could accumulate the cost under your overhead and GNA rates for implementation of the NIST 800-171. So in the government's eyes, we've already been paying you for implementation costs for associated with the NIST 800-171. Okay, you didn't know you were coming for a late afternoon quiz. How many of you think CMMC is about defining CUI? and that the CMMC program office is responsible for CUI. Show of hands. Okay, are you guys not raising your hands because you don't know or you do know? All right, so, so CMMC and the rulemaking hell that my team is in right now is all about the implementation of the validation aspect of the NIST 800-171. Right? It's our team's responsibility to make sure that you are compliant. Oh, God, that picture's awful. Oof. And I had a friend even tell me, agree with me, that that was a bad uh, picture. So I was validated. There you go. All right. So, oh, wait, let me go back. Here's my disclaimer. What does it tell you? I'm in rulemaking. Everything's game and rulemaking. So everything I'm telling you today is our intent, but it could, it could change. All right. CMMC 1.0 came out in January of 2020. We got an interim rule for the 48 CFR rulemaking approved in September of 2020. November was when we could start implementation. And then the administration changed, and then they said, you know what, we need to go back and relook at CMMC, make sure it's hitting the mark, it's doing what we really intended to do. We had received public comment, 850 comments. Now, there were three rules together, right? The 7019, the 7020, and the 7021. How many people understand and are familiar with what the 7019 and the 7020 do? You got it? We can go. All right. And I know there's an overflow room, and you guys are hiding over there because you're not being held accountable to the quiz. I'm going to have to sneak over there. Too bad the cameras can't follow me. We'll go make sure, right? All right. So we went and we re-looked at it. We said, okay, out of those 850 comments, 750 were associated with the CMMC program. And we heard you. It's too hard. There's too much. Uh, it's it's going to be way too expensive. So we said, all right. So we streamlined, and we went from five levels to three. We have level one, which is the foundational, level two, advanced, level three, expert. We decided to strip out the extra 20 requirements and three practices 
So it's just straight back to the NIST 800-171 that you guys have all been familiar with and implementing since 2013 and are all compliant with today. Right? Yep. You promise, right? Cross my heart, Stacy. All right, so then what did we say? We said, all right, it didn't make sense for CMMC level one to be an assessed capability, so we brought it back to a self-assessment. So companies will be required to go into the SPURS database for FCI, right? C CMMC level one is associated with federal contract information and it is aligned to the 52204-21 requirements that are in the FAR today. And that's what you will go into SPURS. You will self-assess against that annually, and you will annually affirm that you are in compliance with that. CMMC level two. This is where we got a little more squirrely in what we did, right? So we said, okay. CMMC level two is going to be commensurate with the old CMMC level three, which is the 800-171 requirements that you have already, have I said this enough, already supposed to have already been implementing. I don't think I can foot stomp it enough. So we said, all right, undoubtedly there is some CUI that is more important than others. There might be some categories. If you go to the NARA database, there are 126 categories. DOD has adopted 105. We are in the process right now of working through with our leadership where this line of possible bifurcation, demarcation would be with CUI, right? Like, so there's one category that's historical archeological information that could be considered CUI and mm, we might put that on the self-assess. Right? So if you are a company who only ever deals with the CUI that's considered to be at the lower level, you would only have to do a self assessment and an annual, triennially, annually, not annually, annually, right? Every three years. And you'll have to do an annual affirmation to say, yay, verily, I'm still in compliance. I haven't done anything to change my environment and I still meet the standards. Then there's going to be the 2B part of CMMC level uh, 2, and that's going to be where you're going to need to get an assessment, and that's where you will handle the higher level CMMC CUI. Now, please understand that it only takes one requirement at that CMMC level 2B to drive you to go get that, that third party certification, right? So this is gonna be done by a contract by contract basis. The third party certification will be on a triennial basis, but we are gonna require an annual affirmation from each company every year to let us know that you're still in compliance. The other beauty of our annual affirmation is it gives us an active point of contact with each one of our DIB partners so we can share threat information. Because that was, a, you know, recently the Shields Up, how many of you are familiar with the Shields Up? Uh, at least you're paying attention, right? So we needed to get information out to our DIB rapidly and we kind of found that we didn't really have a good avenue to do that. So this CMMC, they're gonna rely on to help with that. CMMC level three, the expert, those are gonna be requirements out of the NIST 172 that just recently was published. We are in the final throws. Poor Mr. McEwen, he's going on vacation after next week, and I've got about five things that he's got to do before he goes on vacation. And one of those is making sure that we're all in agreement in the subset baseline requirements out of the 172 that we're going to require for um, companies to meet. Now, what, level three, you will have to get a level two third party assessment performed, and then the DOD DCMA DIBCAC, everybody know what that is? Okay. They will come and do that delta assessment from 2B to 3 for you, okay? Spent a lot of time on that chart. Okay, so another thing that we realized out of those 750 comments that we got was there's a real need for companies to be able to have POAMs but we put some boundaries on your POAMs. All right, so the DOD assessment methodology, how many of you are familiar with that? 
Okay, you need to go look that up. That is the way we score the requirements. It is possible under the DOD methodology to get a negative score, and unfortunately companies have. Now, in that scoring methodology, there are requirements that are scored at the level five, level three, and level one. To be able to get a certification with a POAM, you will need to meet like 85% of the requirements, and you will only be allowed to POAM things that are laid at, <laughs> weighted level one, except for the FIPS encryption. You must meet three a weight of three out of the five, and you can POAM the last two because we recognize that the NIST, Celia, sorry, right? But the NIST approval of your FIPS encryption is the long pole in the tent. So we gave you some weight, uh, some uh, uh, latitude on that. Okay, now, the other thing we realized is there could be a potential need for waivers. What does that mean? Uh-oh. What'd I do? Okay, so waivers. Waivers are gonna be before an RFP ever hit the street. If a program manager goes out and does his uh, market analysis, right, like he's supposed to, and as an old contracting officer, they never did, but if they go out and do their market survey and they find these are innovative companies, there's no way they could even be aware of CMMC or possibly meet CMMC before award, they will go to their service acquisition executive, get a waiver to the CMMC requirement saying they don't have to include it before award of the contract. That will allow them to move to award but that contractor that garners that award will have to become CMMC certified within a given period of time of that contract, and there will have to be a risk mitigation plan put in place to ensure that that um, information stays secure during that time that, uh, that they're basically vulnerable. Now, I've forgotten what's on the next slide. Could be the, the bifurcation picture. Okay, go ahead. Oh, yes. Okay, so it's not up on the screen. But anyway, the next is a pictorial representation of that bifurcation between of level two. But I think, did, does anybody have any questions about that? Or did, was that pretty clear, the way I explained it? Go ahead. Can you go back again, Albert? You said we did level one, right? So only level one items would be allowed in the call, except for two items? No, except for one, which is the FIPS encryption that carries a weight of five, and you must meet three points out of that five, so the last two points could be POAMed, okay? Which the last two points are waiting for your FIPS approval, right? Okay, oh, there we go, there's the picture. Don't you love the green? Isn't it pretty? All right, so hey, we're good to go. Now we're at questions. I'm here for you. Uh, let's see, I think we'll have several mics running around. Somebody have a question immediately here in the audience. Okay. Go ahead, lay them on me. All right, thanks. Uh, it just seems with the- Wait, uh, where are you? Oh, I'm right here. Stand up! I gotta stand up, you gotta stand up. I'm not that tall, I could have been standing up. It seems with the uh, nature of the assessments that at some point there's going to be disagreement between the third party assessor and the entity being assessed. Is there any type of appeals process set up? And if so, who hears that appeal? So the accreditation body is working on and Wayne, have they got it completed? They have a, an adjudication process. Your first level will be going back to the C3 PAO. If they can't solve it, then it elevates to the AB from there. It is the government's intent never to have to get involved, that it will, hopefully the market will bear that out and handle it without us. But yes, there is definitely gonna be an appeals process. Now what I will tell you, okay, Stacy Bostianik's uh, best practices points, right? What we've heard from those companies, the C3 PAOs, and I know there are a couple of people who are here that have gone through their assessment. Best practice, have your documentation done before the assessors ever get there, right? You want to make sure 
that all of your body of evidence is in good order, that it is easy to find, that you have all the people that they need to converse with lined up, and everything that I've ever heard, even from the DIBCAC assessments that they've been doing, right, I think they've done maybe 300 now, is the ones that went the best are with the most organized companies, right? If you have all your ducks in a row and everything else, which is ostensibly going to save you money because those C3 PAOs aren't going to have to be on station as long if you have all your information together. Oh, I know. I, I almost forgot. Joint surveillance. Have you guys heard about the joint surveillance program? Okay, which is really cool. I'm very excited about it. So. Right now, for companies that are interested in getting a C3PAO assessment done, while we're in rulemaking, the DOD DIBCAC has put together a capability called joint surveillance. Here's how it works. The company goes out, they work with their C3PAO, they define the scope and have the scoping call, they, they negotiate their deal, they have that land flat. That C3PAO goes back to the, to the cyber AB, and says, hey, I've got this uh, company that wants to be assessed. The DIBCAC team will assign somebody to oversee that assessment. They'll be able to ingest the report that is um, written by that C3PAO, and that company will garner a DIBCAC high assessment in, in the SPURS database. Now, here's where my legal counsel says I have to say it is our intent that once CMMC gets through rulemaking, either as an interim rule or a final rule, you will get credit for an additional three years of certification and, and it will convert to a CMMC level two certification, be in good stead for three years as long as you do that annual affirmation. Now, having said that, anybody can find some reason to complain about it or fuss in rulemaking and if they do, and we may not be able to do it. So we'll beat that person up once we find out who they are, right? All right, you have the online uh, audience question for you, Stacy. Oh, they can't stand up and I can't look them eye to eye. What that's right, that's right. You can stare into the camera intently. They are shouting at their screens. All right. righteous. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> what is the plan for updating CMMC when 800-171 is updated? So what we have done in our rule is tie ourselves to the NIST 800-171, which is open for comment right now. So make sure you, you, you let your, your thoughts be known. Now, having said that, because I've gotten a bunch of emails like, ooh, are we going to have to update to the new NIST 800-171 as soon as it goes into effect? No. What I have been told, and Robert, you can keep nodding if I, tell me if I get this wrong, but in rulemaking, my rule is tied to that rule, but I have to do rulemaking stuff to update my rule to that rule, which they didn't tell me beforehand. I thought once I got done with this rulemaking stuff, we were done. Ooh. We're going to be in rulemaking forever, is what I heard. Yay, Robert! You need to, you need to shout that from the the mountaintops, and I'm not happy about it. If you change the obligations of those who are subject to the rule, then you will probably need to amend the rule to reflect the new and changed obligations. Yep. That's what we're told. So will it be automatic? No. So you'll have time to adjust and prepare. Okay. Jacob's eye twitching at that comment. <laughs> Mine is, I can tell you that much. <laughs> uh, sorry if I this earlier. Uh, if a contractor has gone through uh, with that and asked for is there a possibility that they would be grandfathered into a level two in CMMC 2.0? Yes. Or are there any thoughts about that? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh oh, no, you're, you're a speaker. You're not allowed to ask me questions. I am. And, and it actually ties into what I'm going to be speaking about today. So ah, um, self serving this question. <laughs> you could say that. Um, the cap. 
document that was released publicly last night. My understanding is that the last version that was handed over to the AB from the DOD, um, that happened maybe three, four weeks ago. So have you had a chance to look at the cap that was released to the public last night, or is that back in the DOD's hands now for review? I believe it's under review by the DOD, right? Yeah, so we got it, I think it was yesterday, to, to re-review it. I have looked at previous versions of it, um, and I know there's a huge push to get that cap out because that's what's going to get the C3PAO started and able to start moving. And we are working very hard to make sure that we get that nailed down and approved as soon as possible. I so think he's given uh, everybody 30 days. The AB has given everybody 30 days to comment on it, right? So if you want some light reading at one evening, make sure you read through it and comment on it if you have any questions or concerns, right? Because I've heard before some of the assessment guides aren't, aren't as understandable as we had hoped. When we wrote those, we intended those, the original ones, level one and level two, were um, at the eighth grade, written for an eighth grader, which means Stacy could understand them. And then it got more uh, technical as we went higher, but we tried to write them in plain English so people could understand them. I, I have a couple follow-ons for that. Oh, uh, so, wait. Now, I thought it was a one-question maximum. Oh, no. The, I just was giving you the context for my question. Oh, so okay. My question, um, first and foremost, is, is the CAP owned actually by the DOD or the AB? No, the CAP is an AB document, okay. and it shall be uh, released by the AB, but per our statement of work, we have the opportunity to review and agree with it before it goes out. Super. And for the Joint Surveillance Program, am I correct in thinking that even though DIBCAC is going to oversee the C3PAO, basically the intent is that the CAP is the process that will be used, not the DIBCAC methodology that they've been using with right. the C3PAO. But when we uh, stripped CMMC back to the 800-171, the processes are pretty much a mirror image. Okay. At some point, I think that you and I should just sit on the stage and, and have a talk about the cap. I would absolutely love that. I've, I've been involved in as an LPP, LTP for a long time. So Thank you for publicly answering my questions, but we have so much more that we want to know as an, a community. So thank you for that, Stacey. Uh, yeah, I've only gotten until three, <laughs> but no, uh, any time, right? I mean, the whole intent of this is not a to trip companies up and put them in a hurt locker. The whole intent, and this is where one of these days I'm going to bring the recording of Lee Greenwood's I'm Proud to Be an American, right? Because you've just given me, it's all your fault, the opportunity to get on my soapbox, right? Why are we doing this? Because we are losing data and information at unbelievable rates, and we're losing them to our adversaries. And I'm sorry, but as a taxpayer, it really upsets me to think that U.S. engineers and scientists put all those hours, blood, sweat, and tears into coming up with an innovative way to make sure that my son, if he ever has to go to war, has the best weapon systems in his hand to make sure he comes back to his mama alive, right? And for us not to want, right? Not to be a helicopter mom, but... I'm a helicopter mom in that aspect. And for us not to protect that data and to do what we need to do to ensure that our adversaries don't get the upper hand, that's what we need to do, right? That's why we're doing this. And, you know, I, how many of you have heard about the cage code problem? All right, so let's not worry about Stacy's son for a minute. Let's just say, yeah, we don't care. He's a slacker anyway, right? He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't ready to move. But I was telling Jacob, they owe my husband a bottle of bourbon because he had to go to Morgantown to move my son out of his apartment. And he got up at four o'clock in the morning to make sure he was home in time to take care of the dog so I could come up here. So, but cage code, hopping, skipping, jumping, okay? You guys need to be aware and protect, you at least do the minimum, because what we're finding is our fine, fine friends 
and other countries are getting in and stealing your cage code information. And when you go to get your payment from the federal government, it goes into their bank account. I met a guy, well, before COVID, I met a guy down in South Carolina. He lost $40,000. He was a construction contractor because somebody stole his cage code. And, and he went to the government and said, hey, when are you going to pay me? They're like, oh, we paid you. And he went, no, you haven't. And then he was like, oh, yes, we did. And when they went back and looked, his information had been changed and the money went to somebody else's account. And the sad part is, sorry for your luck, $40,000 was a good chunk of change to him, but to the DOG, that's a drop in the bucket and they don't have resources to go after it. So there's nobody to assist you in getting your money back. And, you know, it's kind of like fool me once, right? Get on top of your cybersecurity. Pay attention to it. You know, the NIST 800-171, if you talk to the real cyber geeks, it's baseline, people. It's not that high of a bar, right? It's, they, they tell me because I'm not a cyber geek. It's what I should be doing to make sure my neighbors don't get to watch my Netflix, right? Protect yourselves. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, there was, uh, we had a bunch online as well as uh, here in person. So okay. uh, one of them that came in online, the department has an existing way of understanding its high priority programs and projects and data. And it seems like DIBCAC assessments uh, over the last two years haven't been a random lottery. Have or have not? Have not been. Would you say that the DIBCAC assessments that have occurred to date would be a good indicator of the companies that would expect to get CMMC level three requirements? Probably. <laughs> uh, let's see. You can't nail me down, man. Okay. Uh, sorry, somebody that, raised their hand in front. Yeah. Terry, the guy there? right here with the glasses. You look familiar, too. A little bit, Stacey. Do I happen it's to know you? you? Yeah. Um, you said cyber geeks, right? The ones that your experts are kind of stating, hey, this is bare minimum, right? Yes, sir. So how many of those cyber geeks have actually implemented those controls and requirements? Well, at their house or, you know, so, so interesting that you say that, right? Because Congress came to, to us and said, have you all implemented CMMC? You need to eat your own cake. The problem is, is that DOD has implemented the NIST 53, which is a higher bar, which is where we started originally, right? So originally in 2013, they came out and said, hey, all you contractors that are handling in CUI need to be in line with the 53. Well, that didn't work, right? That was a bridge too far. So they backed it down and came up with the NIST 800-171, which is a relaxation of it. So they would tell me, well, Stacy, we've put in place 53, which is harder than that. So, but I do understand the, the hard part for companies, at least this is my perception. You guys don't throw any tomatoes because I got white pants on, but, um, okay. So here's the thought, right? And I just lost that thought. Damn, I hate it when that happens. Um, we think we think it's it's easy, right? We think it's plain and simple and it's understandable. But we, the federal government, because a lot of companies come to me and they're like, just tell me what to do, right? But I can't tell you, go get Umpifrat product and do that. That'll take care of everything you need, right? Because then I would be giving preferential treatment to a particular product. So all we can do is kind of explain around it, right? You can do things like, or these might be an example of, as opposed to giving you a particular direction. And so I know that is wildly frustrating because what most companies want is just tell me what I got to do. Past that though as well, because you know, everybody here and online as well, we're here because we do believe that the information needs to be protected, right? So in a way, it's kind of a little condescending sometimes to kind of start off saying, hey, you guys, you need to protect it. And we're here because we know we need to protect it, right? Here, here's part of the problem, though. It's like it's always easier to say, hey, you go do this, right, when the DOD is not doing their part. So, so for example, 
the, we had a we had a, a response. How rude. <laughs> we had a response earlier from a, a a former KO, right, stating how you know they are they they don't want to deal with the risk, or they're just actually identifying here we're doing copying pasting of of uh, FAR and DFAR rules, right? They're not identifying CUI because interesting, it's hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we we say it's hard. It sounds like we're whining, but. It's always easier, right, to point in another direction and say, hey, you need to do this. Well, you know, the DOD for the last 50 years or 40 years said, I want you to go and build a rocker or a chair, right? All of a sudden, the chair is not good enough. I want you to build a rocker. I need to have smooth sides on it and curves or whatever. You change the rules, right? And, and you did it. <laughs> so. Who, us? Well, yeah. So, so I guess the the. It's a collaborative effort between multiple parties and just to come out and make a statement that's easy or that this is bare minimum, I don't think it's helping anyone. Okay, well, so I will agree, I, I'll, I'll take that point. And in the future, I won't say it's the bare minimum, even though it is, right? And, and, and I think, I think uh, undoubtedly um, the DIBCAC, Right. So how many of you have ever heard John Ellis speak? Right. Don't tell him this, but I love him. He's great. Right. Because he, he he's been in the trenches. And when we have meetings with the Dib SCC and what have you, and we hear some of the perspective of the companies and, oh, my God, this is so hard. He's like, you guys are overthinking this. You're making it way too hard. Now, I don't know if that's truly the case or not, if companies are trying to overthink this. I would kind of think maybe not, since when they did go in and start looking that 95% of the companies didn't even meet 110 the first go-round, that there is some consternation and training that needs to happen. And to your point about the government contracting officer, right? And you guys know I used to be one, right? So here's the deal. It's not their job to, uh, to identify the CUI. It's the program managers. But to that end, if you talk to your program managers today, most of them are probably like, see you what? Wait, wait. Oh, F-O-U-O. No, no, CUI, right? So we're working. And unfortunately, because remember that whole diatribe I went on originally about how my job's just the validation? Guess what? Everybody else is like, yeah, but you can't put it in place until you define it. You can't put it in place until you do the training. So guess what my team, my, my four, how many people, do, how many people know how many people I have working on my team? I've said it at nauseam. How many? Come on, scream it out. Four. four, four people. And we're getting the training done. We're getting the definitions done. We're getting the rule done, right? They're killing themselves. They probably need the bourbon more than my husband, to be honest with you. But to that end, we're trying to make sure that we do have training for the DOD staff so they know what to ask for and how to do it. As far as implementation of the um, requirements, we're working with the PTACs and Project Spectrum. And Celia, sorry for your luck. Celia, stand up. She's in charge of the NIST-MEP program. She's working hand in hand with us to try to help make sure that we get the right resources into your hands to help you get there skirting that fine line of not telling you exactly how to do it, right? Because we can tell you to suck eggs, we just can't tell you how. Okay, okay we got one right here. <laughs> I apologize, this is more like a clarification. You'd mentioned the... Uh... Wait, you're going to make me go back? Yes. I can't remember what I said two minutes ago. I'll give you a, a hint. Okay. You had called it the joint surveillance program. Yes, sir. And I've also heard it the um, early adopter program. Yeah, that fell out of vogue. Okay. It's, it's the same thing, but we're going to call it joint surveillance. So are there any tips on how do you get involved in that? Is there so, a yes. process clearly defined? Y yes, yes, yes. So I thought I said this. Maybe I didn't. What you want to do as a company is to go to the CMMC AB or Cyber AB marketplace. You want to find a, a, an accredited C th or approved C3 PAO. You want to contact that C3PO, talk them about, to them about your environment, negotiate your contract with them. That C3PAO will say, Bob's Auto Parts is ready, right? I got a contract with him. I need to get on DibCAC's uh, calendar. 
Now, DIBCAC has said they're going to work with us. They're going to make sure that they get as many through the pipeline as they possibly can before the rule goes into place for all those companies that are interested, right? And they're great. Nick Del Rosso is in charge of the DIBCAC now. He is fantastic. He and John Ellis and team have been shoulder to shoulder with us the whole time, making sure that what we put in place falls in line with what they've actually seen in, in practice and that we're not doing something that's going to kill people. Okay? So that's, that's, that's the way you do it. Well, thanks, Stacey. Uh, just as a follow-up to that on the AB Town Hall, they said that there are companies, real companies, currently going through the real voluntary assessment process. Well, there, yes. The first one shall begin the 22nd of August. All right. So keep your eyes peeled for when that culminates, we're going to make a big, fat, hairy deal about it. Yes, sir. Let me stand up. <laughs> yes, please, so I can see who I'm talking to. So, so uh, I echo your, your concern about the uh, China and everybody else taking our stuff. I was in the military and I work with the federal government. Um, I took the test, the CUI test that DOD has online. Question is, for me to train the end users, will there be a updated test for them? Because the one I took online was Pretty simple, and you can find the answers on the internet. And also, when you get the PDF form, you can just put a name there. Now, which uh, CUI test? Are you talking about the CMMC assessor test, or are you talking about the DOD's? The DOD one, so we could uh, train the end users in the company about CUI. About CUI and what it is. Yes. Yeah. Do I think they're going to come out with anything a little bit more rigorous? No. Yeah, no. Uh, no. And and they're still now. What I will tell you, right? So um, when we get agreement on the CUI levels, right? And there is some conversations going on in the department about what's prioritized, non-prioritized, that kind of thing, right? That will be your telltale. Right, And what we're trying to do is go through that listing of CUI, the 105, I believe, that DOD adopted out of the 126. And like I said, there's one that's historical archaeological information, right? That might be a 2A. So just real quick, I guess, to follow up on that before we go to the online question, when you talk about prioritized and non-prioritized CUI, you use the example of a different category of CUI, historical, archaeological, versus CTI, which is a very DOD-centric one. Could prioritize CUI be within the CTI category, or is the review of priority only among the existing categories? What I, the reason I ask this question is that I think a lot of contractors, when they hear prioritized versus non-prioritized, believe that their specific piece of CTI could be non-prioritized. But when I hear DOD webinars, it sounds like the priority is saying other categories of right. CUI. So R&E, who are the gurus of CTI, have basically said, oh, no, that, that's prioritized. Now, the entire CTI category? Well, the hard part is until we finish the stratification, right? right I have to say, I dare say there's a lot of CTI around historical, archaeological kind of information, right? So when you look at the way we stratify the non-prioritized, those are most likely going to be areas that are not currently having a whole heck of a lot of research going on with them or development. Would you say there's a lot of manufacturers that put parts on F-35 that deal with archaeological data, or are they probably prioritized? Well... The F-35, well, the F-35, as are, an example, that ship already sailed, right? The okay. Chinese are already fly, flying one just like it. That's one of the reasons why we're here. But yeah, I mean, now, remember, COTS products are not uh, hit by CMMC, right? And if you are a manufacturer of a component, so let's talk about the F-35. How many people think the landing gear or the tires on the F-35 would be a prioritized C CUI, right? They're probably the same tires that are on the T-45, right? So 
when you start looking at the various components and break it down, and this is one of the things where our training is going to be uh, really important because it doesn't make good business sense to say, okay, the F-35 is a, a CMMC level three program and then everybody associated with it has to be CMMC level three. That's overkill, right? But there are components of that that one would say, ooh, if our adversaries got a hold of that, that could be a problem. Navigation system or some, some data link or something like that, right? And I'm not spouting anything that I know for sure. These are things off the top of my head as a, a lay person that I might think would be at level three, right? Not necessarily saying they are. But there are going to be other parts of that aircraft program that would only be prioritized CUI that would only require drive a 2B assessment, right? And then there are other parts, right? The Kapton wiring. Well, that's pretty much standard in every aircraft. So one would probably expect that that would only have to be an FCI level, you know, CMMC level one. Sure. So I have one, I'm just going to jump in, you know, take the privilege here to ask one more question. That's what happens when you're in charge. <laughs> so, um, so within the sense of there are, you're going through training, you're trying to break out the categories uh, in terms of figuring out what's prioritized and not. One of the phenomenon that we see most often is not necessarily the relationship between the DOD and the primes, but the primes themselves over categorizing the CUI. And I think it is a misconception in the DIB that the DOD has some control over the decisions that the primes make. So I think CMMC will probably help that in a kind of a bass backwards kind of way, right? Because they're going to be inspired. And here's the main thing that's driving this, right? Most primes pack up the entire tech data package. Here you go. You figure out what part of this you need to do to be able to do your job, right? And they don't separate out that data. With CMMC, because it's going to drive up rates and costs, it's not going to make good business sense for them to over categorize and say, oh, y'all got to be CMMC level three below me. So what we're going to have to figure out and where we're talking about one of the things in implementation is that the program manager and the primes are going to have to have a CUI conference. And we're not supposed to call it CUI anymore because that's a pig in South America that you can eat. Oh, by the way, somebody told me. Um, so it's going to be inherent upon the team to get together to discuss that CUI, break apart that tech data package in that program and say, okay, Anything that has to do with this, boom, CMMC level three must be protected at the highest level. Anything that has to do with this, boom, it's got to be CMMC level two. This other stuff can either be self-assessed or even just the, the FCI. Right. But that's, and so that's the hope. There is no actual forcing function other than the business case at the prime well, level. Well, but our training and our implementation is going to okay. at least put that into practice. Does that mean that a program manager and a prime can't get lazy? No, but I just don't think it will. They, they won't. They will uh, quickly weed themselves out. Sure. Because they won't be competitive. Okay. Anyone online? Okay. One more. One more. Come on. One okay, more. You got more than that. All right. With the slow pace at which new C three PAOs are being authorized, combined with the volume of companies that will need to be CMMC two point oh level two. What is the plan to ensure there is sufficient supply chain to maintaining our warfighter capabilities? So we are going to have a phased rollout, much like we did last time. Yeah, it depends too, right? If we get an interim rule, you will be able to see the requirement in contracts next summer. If we don't get an interim rule and there is a decision that has to be made by OMB, it would have to go to a, a final proposed rule and you wouldn't see it until the summer of 2024. In the interim, we are working as fast as we can for the C3 PAOs to get on board, get assessors trained, and get the, them up and running. We're doing the joint surveillance program to get it started in advance of the rules so we can get a cadre of companies up and ready and running and ready to go. So I think with the numbers and the collaboration that we have with the AB, we'll be fine. All right, we've made sure of that. That's one of the reasons why we've got that phased rollout. 
One more in person. One, one more, more and then we've got somebody really important coming yep. up. To so we'll have one more in person question and then we'll do our break, which I'm sure people will have individual questions as well. Uh, and then we'll, well go then to the next Well, then I step. need a bottle of water for the next step. <laughs> so as a manufacturer uh, where I supply to a prime uh, and at listing these questions, I, as this level of uh, um, CU, CUI data that we're managing and as we go down our supply chain, it sounds to me that uh, we're trying to get ahead of the curve and be ready, but we're quite a ways down that path where our level is not going to be, um, let's say, uh, surveillance till two years from now, or what's going to happen? So I, I guess uh, you as a company today can make the decision that you are ready for a CMMC certification when your company's ready, right? You have control um, yourself to reach out to a C3PAO and set that up and get on the DIBCAX schedule. If you wait, and it sounds like, you know, hey, if I wait for DIBCAC to tell me it's time, it's going to be a while. And hopefully my rule is going to be in place and the DIBCAC's only going to be doing level threes from that point forward. And nobody will ever tell you besides your prime it's time. I wouldn't wait. If I were in your shoes as a company, if you felt that you deal with CUI and the CUI you deal with could be prioritized, I would go ahead, look at those assessment guides, and I would reach out to a C3PAO when you think you're ready and get started. And, you know, uh, again, back to the whole um, patriotic bent, right? It only is going to help you in the long run because once you get those uh, controls in place, you're going to at least have some modicum of assuredness that you've got some protections. Now, So you're t asking me when should you start requiring your or checking that your subs are okay. So yeah. okay. So if you're looking at when should I make sure my well. So here's the thing for you as a businessman, right? Until you have that CMMC clause in your contract, you are not required to assure that those uh, contractors are capable and protected, right? And so financially, okay. But as you've seen most of the primes do already, they've been notifying their subs like, hey, get ready. Because the last thing you wanna do is be on a team getting ready to propose and oh, Oh, Bob, the one guy I get my bolts from at a, a, you know, good price is not protected and I can't use him. So now I'm, I'm out of Schlitz. I got to go scramble, right? So you want to make sure that your preferred partners are tracking and aware and one thing we would ask, because, you know, I go out and do these speaking events, we do webinars, we do everything we possibly can to get the word out. And I still hear that there's small companies in different places that I guess have their nose to the grindstone and they're not aware. So as much awareness as you can help me bring, I would appreciate it. For you and your business to protect yourself, I would start telling your suppliers, hey, make sure you're aware of this. Make sure you're tracking this. If they only provide you components that don't need to have CUI, then they need to be CMMC level one. You have to wait for us to get our guidance out on the CUI levels for the prioritized and non-prioritized. And I think they don't like that term either. I got to see what they want us to call it, right? Because some people aren't happy with prioritized and non-prioritized. But the 2A CUI, you'll need to understand. You may have some companies that are only at that level. But they need to be prepared. They need to understand what's coming and they need to start working towards that end because everybody I've talked to, it's not quick. That's why this is a pre-award requirement, right? Because programs haven't scheduled their time. They're not 
uh, looking at the fact that, oh, I got to award this thing and then I got to wait six to eight months for Bob to get certified. And what happens if Bob doesn't get certified? What does that do to my program? Because I got Congress coming down on me going, you haven't, obligated, you haven't expended your money. Your expenditure rates are low. We're going to take your money away from you, right? If you're aware of the way the, the whole funding and appropriations works in these contracts and programs, they got it, they got, they're held to a timeline and a schedule. 